Shall we start? Yeah. Um, so today I'm going to show you how you can use the T0 curve to design some really excellent steels. And these curves are now used uh, in many, many circumstances to study steels and also to design alloys. So all of the trip steels, for example, and so on. So just to remind you, these are the free energy curves of ferrite and austenite at a constant temperature T1. And normally when we want to calculate an equilibrium phase diagram, we draw a tangent that is common to both of those surfaces. And where, they touch, where the tangent touches, you get the equilibrium composition of ferrite at the temperature T1 and the equilibrium composition of austenite at the temperature T1. This point here is where austenite and ferrite of exactly the same free energy have the same chemical composition. And the locus of this point as a function of temperature defines the T0 curve. If the austenite has a carbon concentration in excess of T0, it cannot transform into ferrite without a composition change because you get an increase in free energy and the vice versa on the other side of the T0 curve. So, um, we used that concept in order to show that the bainite transformation is diffusionless. That means it occurs without any chemical composition change, but it's happening at a temperature where carbon can diffuse out of the bainitic ferrite and deposit itself into the remaining austenite. So supposing I have a, a steel with a composition X bar, and there are no other reactions happening. For example, precipitation of cementite is not happening, and so on. Then I form a plate of bainite with the average composition of the steel, but it partitions carbon, so the austenite becomes richer in carbon, and the next plate of bainite is forming from richer austenite, and this process can continue until the composition of the austenite hits the T0 boundary, and T0 dashed is simply T0 modified by strain energy. Term, okay? uh, if the transformation happens where the bainitic ferrite is never saturated with carbon, that means it has the equilibrium carbon concentration, this process can go on until the A3 curve is reached. Okay, so there's a very big difference here and here, and therefore um, we conclude that the reaction is diffusionless because it stops at T0. And notice also that if I lower the temperature, I can get more bainite than at a higher temperature. And at some point here, there would be no bainite at all. Yeah? And I gave you the one piece of experimental evidence to show that the reaction does indeed stop at the T0 curve. So if you allow the reaction to proceed to completion, uh, then you can work out the carbon concentration of the austenite at the point where it stops by looking at this T0 curve. Okay, is everyone happy with all that? Right. Yes, yes. So, uh, with martensitic transformations, it's uh, diffusionless. Uh, but it's forming at a relatively low temperature, so you need to actually raise the temperature for the carbon to escape. Of course, if the martensite start temperature is very high, then it will also auto-temper, and auto-tempering is another term for saying that, you know, changes will happen while the martensite forms. Yes, but uh, I mentioned to you that there are two major differences uh, between bainite and martensite. And one of them is that the chemical driving force available for bainite is smaller than for martensite. Okay? Now, that has two consequences. One we talked about in the last lecture, which is that it is much more susceptible to mechanical stabilization. Okay? But the second one is that the driving force for nucleation is quite small compared with martensite. And that means that you pick up the isothermal character more than you pick up with martensite. Yeah? Okay?
Sorry, say again. What's the sin of unfinite? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's correct. That's correct. Now, this is the slide which was misbehaving in the last lecture. So I brought it here again to summarize the mechanism of the Bainite transformation that really the plate forms exactly like martensite without the diffusion of carbon. The difference is arising because the driving force is small and the austenite is mechanically weak. Uh, upper Bainite forms at a relatively high temperature, so the carbon has an opportunity to escape, okay? and then it precipitates as cementite from the austenite. In the case of lower bainite, the temperature is relatively low, so the carbon takes a greater time to escape. There's an opportunity for particles to precipitate inside the plate uh, and fewer particles to precipitate between the plates. Okay? These particles of carbide can be very bad for mechanical properties if we are doing strong steels. Okay, so strong steels, I mean, you know, more than 1,600 megapascals. When the cementite particles themselves behave in a brittle manner and cause fracture. Okay. And just to show you that, uh, th these are cementite particles in bainite, and if you measure the Charpy impact toughness as a function of temperature, then without carbides you have this curve, and when you introduce carbides, you can see that the Charpy energy decreases, the impact transition temperature increases. Yeah, are you familiar with Charpy testing? Yeah? So the higher the impact transition temperature, the worse is the toughness of the steel because you will produce brittle fracture at a higher temperature. So you really want this uh, impact transition temperature to be less than room temperature, okay? Right, so this is the reason why uh, for many, many decades, uh, tempered martensite has been the preferred choice for strong steels compared with bainitic steels because during tempering you can control the precipitation of carbides, whereas here the carbides form and you are stuck with the carbides, however coarse they are, okay? Right, so what do we need to do to improve the situation? Well, uh, if we can cut the reaction here, yeah, so stop this from happening, this stage of the bainite reaction from happening, then we have a structure which just consists of bainitic ferrite and austenite. Okay. How can we stop this? How can I stop cementite from precipitating? So do you know the difference between gray cast iron and white cast iron? Okay, so white cast iron uh, has huge amount of cementite whereas gray cast iron has graphite. So do you know how we change from white cast iron to gray cast iron? Or let me put it another way, what retards the precipitation of cementite? Sorry? Yeah, yeah, but we're not allowed to do that. We want to form the bainite but stop the second stage, yeah? Is there any element that would do? Silicon. So if you want to change white cast iron into gray cast iron during solidification, then you simply add enough silicon to retard the precipitation of cementite. So it's been known for more than 100 years how to do this. So if we increase the silicon concentration in our steel, then cementite precipitation is retarded. Uh, now, the reason why cementite precipitation is retarded is because silicon has almost zero solubility in cementite. Okay? So if the cementite is forming temperature, it will be forced to take the silicon into its lattice and therefore it will be very unstable. Okay? Now, how do I know that cementite with silicon will be unstable? Uh, well, we can't measure the thermodynamic properties because the solubility is zero. So we did first principles calculations in GIFT here, 
where we took the unit cell of cementite and we pulled out an iron atom and substituted it with a silicon atom in the computer and calculated the thermodynamic properties. And you can see here that compared with all of the atoms being iron atoms, if I substitute a silicon atom, I get a dramatic rise in the energy of that unit cell. And similarly, uh, these are just two different positions in which you substitute the silicon atom for iron. So you get these thermodynamic properties, and then you put them into the usual thermodynamic databases, and you can calculate uh, phase diagrams for the effect of silicon on cementite. Okay? So basically, it works to retard the precipitation of cementite because it really hates the cementite lattice. Okay? And you need something of the order of one weight percent to have a big effect on the precipitation of cementite from austenite. Okay? Right, so here's uh, three alloys, right? Uh, very, very simple alloys. Uh, this one has 0.4 weight percent carbon, 2 weight percent silicon to stop the cementite forming, and manganese to give it sufficient hardenability to stop high temperature reactions from happening. And I'll explain to you why these two alloys exist, but notice that this is half the carbon concentration, otherwise it's similar to the top one. And this is similar to the top one, except manganese is replaced by nickel. So let's, let's just focus on this particular one and look at the microstructure that we get when we transform it into bainite. So here is the structure. You've seen it before. Uh, look at the scale over there. It's one micrometer. The plates of bainitic ferrite are about a quarter micrometer. That's incredibly small. You know, if you look at thermomechanical processing of steels, that leads to a grain size of the order of 10 micrometers. Yeah, so just by phase transformation, you get enormous refinement of the size. And now these are films of austenite. Because we have the silicon there, the cementite doesn't precipitate, so the partitioning of carbon into the austenite stabilizes the austenite. Okay? So we are using the cheapest possible element to stabilize the austenite. It's not nickel, for example, in stainless steels. Here, we have an average carbon concentration which is low, but because the ferrite forms, it partitions carbon, and therefore you get extremely cheap austenite with a high carbon concentration of the order of one weight percent or more. So the carbon is now partitioned into these regions, uh, which remain austenitic, okay? uh, whereas these are depleted in carbon compared with the average value. Okay, so it's beautiful structure where you have a fine scale and a fine scale is good for strength and for toughness. Strength because you put lots and lots of barriers in the way of dislocation motion and toughness because a cleavage crack will be halted at every boundary in the interface. So grain size refinement is one of the best ways of increasing both strength and toughness. Okay? Any fool can design a strong material, but it may not be tough. Yeah. So grain size refinement is excellent. Uh, there are many other advantages uh, to this structure. Okay, so we've already talked about the fine structure. Can you think of any other advantages to having a structure which is a fine mixture of ferrite and austenite? Um, I don't know enough about corrosion, I'm afraid. There might be consequences, but I don't know enough. There, there's not uh, chromium, for example, in this material. Think about the austenite. Why, why do we often want austenite inside our material? Yeah, during deformation, it undergoes phase transformation, doesn't it? What do we call that effect? Trip, right? Transformation-induced plasticity. So we have a fine structure, and the retained austenite can undergo transformation, and that somehow helps us to get more ductility. 
we'll go into that in more detail in a later lecture. But austenite itself doesn't have a ductile brittle transition temperature. So it behaves in a ductile manner at all temperatures, right? It's the ferrite which has a ductile brittle transition temperature. So if we have austenite, then that's got to be good for toughness. And hydrogen diffuses very, very, very slowly in austenite compared with ferrite. So it's almost like having a diffusion barrier to the ingress of hydrogen into steel. And hydrogen is a bad thing for steels. Yeah? Okay, so there are many advantages of having the austenite. And then the fact that we don't have cementite means that it's difficult to nucleate cleavage as long as our steel is made clean. You know, if it, does, if it has non-metallic inclusions, then you're in trouble again. But it's possible to make steels very, very clean. And therefore, then the cementite becomes the uh, damaging inclusion. But we do not have any cementite at all because we use silicon to stop that from forming. And in an earlier lecture, we said that carbon has a huge effect on the hardness of ferrite, but not of austenite, because in austenite it just causes an isotropic strain, but in ferrite it causes a tetragonal strain, which can interact strongly with dislocations. So we only have a small concentration of carbon left in the ferrite, which itself will behave in a ductile manner. Okay? So we have all these advantages of this beautiful structure, which is just obtained by simple phase transformations, no need to deform, etc. So let's see what the toughness of this material looks like. Is that good toughness? Well, I've already said it's very poor toughness because look at the impact transition temperature. Uh, it's, it's, you know, 100 degrees centigrade. This would be useless as a structural material. So in spite of everything I've said, which is wonderful about this structure, something is very wrong. Yeah? Some, we have missed something. Okay? So uh, the micrograph that I showed you was a transmission electron micrograph. So we're looking at a very small region of the specimen. So I'm going to show you now a low resolution micrograph. So here is an optical micrograph. Uh, you can see the scale here. And what you see is there are large regions here of austenite which are untransformed, uh, whereas in the transmission micrograph you saw the thin films which are in these regions which we can't resolve. Yeah? Now, these large regions are of the order of 50 micrometers in size. And when you apply a stress to the material, they decompose to martensite. And that martensite is high carbon, untempered martensite. Yeah? So imagine that you make a really beautiful material and then you throw a brick which is the size of 50 micrometers in there. That's a bad thing, right? If you have a hard particle which is 50 micrometers size, you are going to get very poor toughness. So the reason why we have these large regions is the T0 curve. Is that once the transformation reaches a point where the austenite has the same composition as the T0 curve, it stops. It doesn't matter if I hold it at temperature for 20 years, it will stop, right? 20 years is an exaggeration because other reactions might happen, but you know what I mean, okay? So it seems that there's nothing we can do about this because, you know, it's a thermodynamic limit. So let's see if we can play about with it, all right? There are three ways in which you can do this. Right, so here is our T0 curve. And let's assume that the ferrite has zero carbon concentration. Then just by applying the lever rule to the T0 curve and the ferrite composition, you can derive this equation here, which gives you the volume fraction of bainite. Okay? So uh, you really want to increase the volume fraction of bainite to get rid of the larger regions of austenite. Is everyone happy with that? Everyone happy with this lever rule here? That the volume fraction of bainite is this distance divided by this distance. Yeah? So that's very simple. This is the T0 composition. X bar is the average composition. 
and x alpha we have assumed to be zero, the composition of the ferrite. Okay, is everyone happy with that? Very simple equation, right? So tell me how I can increase the volume fraction of bainite. There are three ways. You've got an equation there. What can you do to increase the volume fraction of bainite? Do what to x bar? That's correct. But what, what should I do? x bar is the average carbon concentration. Yeah, make it smaller, all right? Now, will that reduce the strength? No, because we are not getting the strength from the carbon. Remember, the ferrite has very little carbon, and carbon doesn't cause much strengthening in the austenite. So if we increase the volume fraction of bainite, we actually make it stronger, okay? What else can I do? So that's one method. There are three methods, I told you. Hmm? Sorry? Right, right, right. But we are stuck with the shape because place of transformation. Yeah? But just looking at this equation, if we can do something to move the red curve to greater carbon concentrations, yeah? Uh, to do that, we need to modify the relative free energies of ferrite and austenite by using substitutional alloying additions. Okay? So if we can change the position of this curve to higher carbon concentrations by using substitutional solutes, that's another way. And the third way I already illustrated to you in one of the slides is to lower the temperature. But what is the limit to the lower temperature? Yeah, yeah. You, you, do, you want to avoid Martin's height, yeah? Okay, let's see what we can do. So, in this steel, we are reducing X bar, nothing else, right? So it's very simple. The theory tells us that if we reduce X bar, we will get more bainite, and therefore we will improve the toughness because we reduce the large regions of austenite. And in this, we are changing the substitutional element so that the T0 curve moves to a larger carbon concentration. So you can see that this is the manganese containing steel and this is the nickel containing steel and it shifts the T0 to a greater concentration. So we have done nothing except used our theory, right? To make two predictions. Both of these steels should have much better toughness without a loss of strength. So let's see what happens. So first of all, um, we've reduced the size of the islands of austenite and we've got basically the same bainite microstructure with thin plates of bainite and these are dark field images of the retained austenite. So everything is fine so far. The structure is fine. We've reduced the regions of uh, large blocky austenite. And whoa, this is terrible. Uh, so you have this graph in your notes, don't you? Yeah. Uh, basically, we are plotting here the toughness versus the temperature. It's basically this computer, you know? Okay. Uh, vertical scale is uh, impact energy in joules. Right. So this is the original alloy, 0.4 carbon to silicon 3 manganese, and the impact transition temperature is more than 100 degrees centigrade. Very, very simple modification, and we've changed the transition temperature by 200 degrees centigrade. Okay. So it isn't that we've made 100 alloys and tried to see what happens, but your simple theory which you have learned, and the T0 curve, you can just download the software from my website to do these calculations completely changes the toughness. Yeah, so we, in alloy design, you don't really want to make 100 alloys. You want to see what is causing 
and then do a calculation change and remarkable improvement in toughness, both of the alloys. Right, now, what is this? Do you know, do you recognize this? Yeah. Railway lines, right? Different kinds of railway lines, they're all shaped similarly. And what do you think is the structure of the normal railway line? Here, you said it, but say it loudly. Perlite, yeah? Okay, and what is perlite? Yeah, say it loudly. Alternating layers of cementite and ferrite, right? Right, so th this is the structure that you see in a rail steel. It's uh, these layers of cementite and ferrite. Now, I've said to you before that we need to be careful when we are looking at two-dimensional sections. Are these really alternating layers of ferrite and cementite? It's good to have this structure because it's very strong, right? And the finer you make the spacing, the stronger it will be. But are these independent crystals of ferrite and cementite? What is the three-dimensional structure of perlite? That's my question. So Hillett did this uh, about 50 years ago. So if I, if I looked at a region like this, how many crystals of cementite and ferrite do I have? Yeah, yeah how many, how many louder? Yeah, I'm yeah. Okay, so um, let me, let me show you, okay? This is the perfect description of perlite. So cementite is like a cabbage. All the leaves are connected, right? In three dimensions. So it's a single crystal of cementite. If I put it in a bucket of water, and you think of the water as a single crystal of ferrite, then you have two interpenetrating single crystals of ferrite. So a colony of perlite, when I cut this cabbage, it will look like it's alternating layers, right? But in three dimensions, the colony of perlite is a, sing is a bicrystal. So if you have a crack running across it, it won't be deflected very much. Yeah? Uh, therefore, you know, when you refine the interlamellar spacing, you increase the strength, but you don't improve the toughness. So the problem with normal rail steels is always been one of toughness and of course, there are other issues like rolling contact fatigue and so forth. But the toughness of politic rails is not as good as it should be, right? Now, in the structure that we designed, you know, the bainite, austenite, bainite, austenite, there are no carbides at all. It would be tough, and we've seen that it is tough. So we made railway lines out of this structure. Okay? And one of the damage mechanisms which is very common in railway lines is that you have a wheel which goes over a rail. So it causes a large stress under the surface. Every time it goes, there's a stress pulse. So that causes a, something called rolling contact fatigue. So after a while, the crack under the surface spreads and then a bit of the rail comes off. So these are full-scale tests done on the new structure. For the normal politic rail, uh, hardened politic rail, and for the new one where there was no failure. Okay? So these are very expensive tests, so we stopped them at that point. Okay? So rolling contact fatigue has disappeared. Uh, so, martensite is harder in this case than the perlite, yeah? And fatigue, in fatigue, if you make something harder, normally it's more difficult to initiate cracks, yeah? Uh, not always true, but sometimes true. Uh, and here we are looking at rolling contact fatigue, so stresses under the surface of the rail, yeah? 
their maximum under the surface. So if you put the rail into service, okay, and this is the normal head-hardened politic rail, so Martin site at the surface, and this is the new rail. This is a, a test site in the USA where a heavy train goes round and round and round. Yeah? And you're looking here at uh, about 90 million gross tons going over the rail during this test. And you can see the difference on this side and this side. Okay? Huge difference, right? And indeed, the wear rate is very small. So this is rolling contact wear rate. Uh, this is for the rail, and this is for the wheel that goes over it. And this is the only structure which reduces also the wear rate on the wheel. Because the normal story is that if you improve the wear resistance of the rail, it makes it worse on the wheel. This is the only structure because it has none of these hard particles which peel off and cause debris, which then increases wear. It has a much lower wear rate. Have you, uh, has any one of you been from Britain to France? No? Okay, so you must come to Cambridge, all right, and then you'll have an opportunity to just, just go and see the Eiffel Tower. And there are several ways of going to France, but one of them is through the tunnel under the sea, right? So there's a train, channel tunnel train. And this is a picture taken inside the channel tunnel trail with the new rail material that we designed. Okay? So this is actually being used in the channel tunnel. And this is a, a torpedo truck. That means it's carrying molten steel on a steel plant, and this was a test rail installed on that site, made out of the carbide-free bayonetic rail steel. Okay, uh, of course, rail steels are not the only things where you can use this concept. If I plot uh, the fracture toughness, K1C, yeah, against the ultimate tensile strength, then this is a domain for common quenched and tempered martensitic steels. And this is the domain for maraging steels. Maraging steels have almost zero carbon concentration, but you quench them to martensite. They have a high concentration of nickel and molybdenum. And the martensite is soft because it doesn't contain carbon. So then you age it at around 550 degrees centigrade to precipitate nickel molybdenum compounds which make it very strong and it's extremely tough as well. You can, you can see that here. Even at very high strength you've got 80 megapascal root meters of toughness. But it's very expensive, right? You can see here bainitic steels without carbides are matching the properties, the toughness strength combinations of maraging steel. So, Many other applications, for example, in bolting alloys, you know, Swiss steel makes bolting alloys using this concept, for example. Yeah. And uh, in the last lecture, I will show the same structure, but strength levels around two and a half gigapascals. Okay. Okay. So. What we've learned in the first three lectures was some very simple concepts about martensite and about bainite, and therefore you learned how to design steels using that concept, and the key concept was the T0 curve. So if I go back to that T0 curve, You have a huge amount of information here. Okay? Uh, first of all, you've got the average carbon concentration of the steel. Uh, you can calculate the volume fraction of bainite, assuming you allow the transformation to proceed until the T0 curve is reached. Okay? You can calculate the carbon concentration of the austenite at the point where the reaction stops. 
So if I cool the material from this temperature, what should happen if I cool it rapidly? Some of that austenite will transform to martensite, right? Yeah? So we've, we've got the volume fraction of bainite, we've got the carbon concentration of the austenite, and therefore we have the carbon concentration of the martensite. Since you have the composition of the austenite, you should be able to work out the martensite start temperature, right? If you have the martensite start temperature, then using the Koistinen and Marburger equation, you can work out the volume fraction of martensite that forms. So you have a complete calculation of the microstructure. You have the volume fractions of bainite, austenite, martensite, and the compositions of every phase. So that is your homework, actually, for this. If you look at the online homework, yeah, that is the calculation for you to do. Okay, so remember that, because the deadline for that is tomorrow, because there's only one question, I think. Okay? <laughs>